Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining Winslow Technology Group and Arctic Wolf Networks to discuss cybersecurity best practices. The big question we are answering in today's webinar is, if I could do five and only five things to enhance my cybersecurity posture, what would they be? For those of you who don't know me, my name is Al Segievsky. I am one of the senior solutions architects for Winslow Technology Group. And joining me this morning is Jeff Miller, channel account manager for Arctic Wolf Networks. We'll kick off today with a brief overview of Winslow. Then I'll hand over the mic to Jeff to tell you more about Arctic Wolf and discuss some cybersecurity concepts in greater detail. Finally, we'll wrap up by answering any questions you may have. So please do feel free to ask them at any time via the chat feature of this webinar. Now a little about Winslow. We have been in business for over 16 years as a technology solutions provider headquartered in Waltham, Mass. We have a distributed workforce and recently opened satellite offices in Charlotte, North Carolina, as well as New York, New York. Our goal is to identify and develop expertise in game-changing technologies, an example being our partnership with Arctic Wolf. Winslow works with customers like you to tailor technology solutions that solve for both today's problems and tomorrow's opportunities. We specialize in hardware, software, and services for core data center, as well as end user compute and cybersecurity. Winslow is a Dell Technologies Titanium partner, and we're proud to have industry recognized awards, including both Dell Technologies Partner of the Year and Arctic Wolf Partner of the Year for 2019. We have an installation base in 37 states, as well as four Canadian provinces and a number of international locations. Now, in terms of cybersecurity, Winslow Services follows the NIST cybersecurity framework. And as illustrated here, a bit of an eye chart, I'm afraid, is how those various technologies and services we offer line up with the five pillars of that framework. As you can see, the depth and breadth of that offering is significant. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jeff Miller, who will introduce Arctic Wolf and lead our discussion on cybersecurity best practices. Jeff? Good morning, and thank you, Alex. I appreciate that. Um, this topic is very near, <laughs> near and dear to me. Um, I'm actually sitting here in New York City today, and it's, it's bonkers with the virus going on and everything that's happening. Um, prior to working at Arctic Wolf, I, I was in IT operations for the New York State Attorney General. Um, 1,800 lawyers right right here in Manhattan. Um, and one of the things that I ran into all the time was, like Alex said, we have the NIST framework to follow. It's a great framework. It breaks cybersecurity into five chunks that are more bite-sized. But how do I prioritize within those five pillars? And that was always the constant issue that I had trying to hurry up and put things in place that we would protect uh, the data that we were storing, protect... Um, you know, the privacy of consumers that we were working with and so on. It just became a lot to deal with, even with those bite-sized chunks. So what we did is we put together today's presentation based on, you know, what I know uh, in the past, what I've, what I've done in the last 15 years of, of doing cybersecurity on a street level. Um, and, and the goal, again, like Alex said earlier, is to help you understand if you could only do five things within your cybersecurity practice and do those first, what would those things be? So um, this is the, the agenda today. Um, we're going to talk about why, why even be on the phone today. Um, I think a lot of you had sought a value of this. You're, you're here, but I'll, I'll dig in deeper there. Um, the five things that uh, we'll go over today are a vulnerability management strategy, an authentication strategy, the concept of least privilege, what it means and how to implement it, detection and response, which is becoming increasingly baked as a requirement into newer cybersecurity regulations, and then a communication strategy. So, so plans, plans are gonna fail if everybody's running around with their heads chopped off. Those are the five things we'll go over and there will be time at the end uh, for some Q&A as well. So um, why, why this is an important topic? The fact is we are limited in resources. We have finite time, finite budgets. We're constantly trying to understand what the, the next you know, version of ransomware is, the next phishing attack, the next thing that's coming out that we need to put protections in place. So with those, those dollar limitations, the time limitations, staff limitations, we're at a disadvantage. Whereas hackers, on the other hand, they've got all the time in the world to sit around and, and plant things into our systems. 
on average, it's over 200 days between when a hacker gets into your network and when you actually detect that they're in there. So if you can imagine the amount of damage that, that can be done in 200 days, it's pretty significant unless you have practices in place to, to catch them before that. Um, so again, the goal of this presentation is to help you answer the following question. If I could do five and only five things to secure my organization, what would those things be? We'll start off with the, the, the first and most important one, which is a vulnerability reduction strategy. So as you see on the bottom here, vulnerability is a weakness, and it's, it's essentially any area in which a hacker could, could breach you. So what does that mean practically? Well, in computer security, a vulnerability is a weakness that can be exploited by what we call a threat actor. A lot of times we call those hackers um, to perform unauthorized actions within a computer system. To exploit a vulnerability, an attacker must have at least one application tool or technique that can connect to a system weakness. And the sum of all the vulnerabilities in your environment is known as your attack surface. And, and obviously the idea here is we wanna reduce the attack surface. Perhaps the largest vulnerability in any organization is having assets in your network that you don't know about for two reasons. If you don't know about it, you can't protect it. That seems pretty obvious. Also, if you don't know about it, you can't quickly contain it if it gets breached. The number one first thing you must do in any cybersecurity program is to know what you have. At Arctic Wolf, we accomplish this with our managed risk offering that continue, continuously scours the network and devices to report on hardware and software inventory so you don't have any devices out of your management oversight. Once you know what's in your network, you need to know where the vulnerabilities are on those devices. The sum of vulnerabilities, again, is called your attack surface. Every organization must have a plan for reducing the attack surface as much as possible. Regular vulnerability scanning coupled with a centralized patch management system, such as SCCM or SolarWinds or any, any similar ones like that, will ensure that you both know what your attack surface is and have a reliable method for shrinking it. And these tools need to be looking not only at Windows or Mac vulnerabilities, but also third-party applications like Adobe Acrobat Reader, Google Chrome, and then, hey, most of us have something in the cloud, some form of line of business application. So there needs to be a plan there as well. Um, the bottom line here is, and, and this is whether you're looking at the NIST framework, the CIS top 20 critical controls, or any other framework, they all are in agreement that you have to know what you have and know where it's weak. And from there, you begin your cybersecurity journey. Moving on to the second of the five points here today is an authentication strategy. Um, authentication is the fundamental process of stating and subsequently proving one's identity. These days we do that with a username and password by and large. The problem with authentication these days is generally just username like jmiller or jeff.miller at arcticwolf.com and a password is easily bypassable. So attackers with any level of patience can quite easily guess my password by mere brute force. Things that I'm posting online, my theme of my dog and so on. An attacker will systematically check all possible passwords and passphrases until they find the correct one. And there are many freely available tools that will automate that process for them, bringing the bar down significantly in terms of effort. Furthermore, with phishing emails, many users find themselves inadvertently giving their passwords away after being tricked to click a link and enter their private information to a website. So what do we do about it, right? The, it's, it's a multi-pronged fix in my mind. So first of all, um, again, I, I worked at the Attorney General's office. We had an industrial air, con air conditioning system for our data center, and I was in IT operations. I was poking around to see um, you know, what was out there, what was on the network, if there were any default passwords. And sure enough, our Liebert air conditioning system had a default password of admin. What does that mean? It means I can turn off the air conditioning system in the data center, cause all the systems to fry, you know, irreparable damage, and, and that, that could be hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in many days of downtime. Spread that across 1,800 staff members, and you're, you're suddenly looking at a very significant problem. Another thing that people would do there is, is, okay, I can access this system. Can I move laterally throughout the network? So now that I've got gained a foothold here, what else can this device talk to that I can now go and communicate with and gain admin privileges? So just one area of entry can really open up the floodgates. So 
you know, we all have home routers, Linksys routers, or something like that. You got to make sure that the default passwords are changed out of the gate. That's the first thing, and that doesn't cost any money whatsoever. The second thing is complexity requirements. So, just as an example, if somebody uses all lowercase passwords, such as in the password vacation, then the character set is 26, right? The alphabet. In this case, there are 209 billion possible combinations of eight character passwords. To break an eight character password, it takes, it'll take an average computer in the year 2020 about two days. On a supercomputer or a botnet or you know, Amazon, it'll take 1.8 seconds to crack an eight character password just using the alphabet. If you include symbols, then depending on the symbols used, there's, there's about 80 characters in the set to break a password such as percent %ZBG, BV bracket eight, it would take 45.2 years on an average computer. With a supercomputer, AWS, that, that would take four hours. So even including uh, special characters doesn't significantly, significantly increase the burden on attackers that are, are trying hard to break in. What, uh, what will increase the effort on their part is to increase uh, the minimum password set to 10 characters and using special characters and passwords um, to the jump from eight to 10 will go from four hours to about three years, even on a supercomputer. The moral of the story is that your passwords should be at least 10 characters long and include a mix of numbers and lowercase letters and symbols. Um, so not doing that is putting you at, at grave risk, especially with all the brute force attacks that are easily able to be accomplished. And then the final strategy, and it just bugs me that people don't do this, is multi-factor authentication on everything that's internet facing, right? I have a YubiKey, it sits on my keychain. I use it to unlock my, uh, unlock my last pass, password database. And there I store all my crazy long complex passwords that I don't even have to remember because they're sitting there in LastPass. Um, so I use MFA to unlock LastPass and, and in LastPass is where I store my very long uh, complex passwords. Most of us have some kind of, again, online um, workflows, the things, things like Office 365 or Salesforce. These things need to be front-ended with MFA. Google, you'll see on the right, deployed MFA to all of their employees and found that after doing that, nobody was getting fished. Because the attackers, even if they get access to your account via cracking your password, if they don't have the hardware token, they're, they're not able to get in. They won't pass the second factor of authentication. And again, it's, it's kind of dubious security to me that people aren't doing this these days, given the low cost to do so. That's my opinion. Now, least privilege. Uh, this is kind of a fundamental security concept, um, but unfortunately, it's one that we often fail on. Um, I, again, I, I'll reference a previous experience I had we had an IT admin at one point in my career that moved from, you know, from HR to finance, finally got himself into IT. I'm not sure how that career path, you know, trajectory ended up that way. But essentially, he was in multiple departments over multiple years, and nobody went back to look at what privileges he had. And this guy had been there for, for over a decade, um, and he had accumulated all these rights and all these systems, and, he, and some of them were, he had full admin rights. One day uh, he, he got clicked an email, it was a phishing attack. It was a coupon for a burrito of all things. And through that, uh, he obtained ransomware that went out into all the areas of the network in which he had access and, and encrypted over two terabytes of data. I was the guy on the receiving side who was the backup administrator. It took me 48 hours to get the information back and had several hundred employees unable to get their work done or access their files because a single person was allowed to amass all these privileges over time. So after that incident, of course, you can imagine, we, we instituted a mandatory periodic uh, privilege review to ensure that that kind of thing doesn't happen again. The bottom line is least privilege is the concept that you're only, you should only have access to what you need to do to get your job done. Anything more than that is excessive. If you see, if you look on the top right here, if, if you can't write to it, or if, if malware can't write to it, it can't encrypt it. So 
myself, if I'm in IT, I shouldn't have rights to HR or finance or, you know, engineering or any of these other file shares that I just don't need access to to get my job done. Uh, and that goes for any employee in any department. The more we limit what they have, the less effect ransomware will have as the predominant attack these days because simply the, the malware can't write to those directories for which it does not have permission, okay? Um, another thing here on the bottom, I see this a lot in healthcare, people will share accounts. You might have a single computer sitting in a hallway, multiple three, four, five people log into it using the same password. Well, think about what, what does that do? If somebody decides to go and do something malicious and blow out a database, delete files, view files they shouldn't have access to, if you're using a shared username and password, you can't hold anybody accountable because you can't pin who did it, right? So that's another no-no as well in terms of least privilege. Um, another thing too, IT providers or anybody who has access to administrative privileges shouldn't be logged into the system with those privileges. Immediately doing that means next time you get fished or ransomware makes its way into your network, you are a, just a heaping pile of risk. So um, the best practice there is only to elevate your privileges when you need to perform an administrative function during those periods of time, and certainly not to log in and 24 seven be logged in with those administrative privileges. So the, the fourth thing here um, out of five is detection and response. I mentioned earlier, uh, detection and response is, is Used to be like a fancy thing, right? You could, you know, you could buy a Toyota and it would get you where you needed to go. You could buy a Cadillac and it would get to, get you there in style. Detection and response was seen to be in that second category, where it was a great thing to have if you were mature, um, if you were going above and beyond uh, your peers. But it's now not only normal for people to have; it's required in many cases. The New York State Shield Act is uh, is one of those examples that requires continuous monitoring. That goes live in 20 days. So March 21st, the New York State Shield Act goes live. And again, it does require that people have the ability to monitor for unauthorized system access on a continuous basis. So it doesn't quite say detection and response, but my translation equates to that. At some point, your organization will get breached even despite implementing all the things that we've discussed today. So no security strategy is guaranteed to keep you 100% safe. And that's why it's important to have a strategy when the inevitable intrusion does happen. Um, I'll, just, I'll just put it right out there now also, relying on cyber liability insurance is not an adequate catch-all plan for dealing with a breach. Though a lot of you have, are toying around with that idea, I'll just say don't. Insurance won't get your data back. It won't get your reputation back. And rest assured, if you must use insurance, your policy next year will be exponentially higher. In fact, two New York State senators right now have recently proposed bills to ban local municipalities and other government entities from using taxpayer money for paying ransomware demands. So there's now even legislation coming out. It hasn't yet been passed, but people are considering banning the payment of ransomware monies to attackers. So that's interesting to me, and I'm tracking that as, as that unfolds. We do recommend investing in cyber liability insurance, but don't have a false sense of security just because you're paying a premium every month. Don't let that be your quote unquote cybersecurity plan. It's, it's just, it's a bad position. When an attack happens, three things must happen. You must have processes in place to understand the attack and the affected systems and involve the right people in the right departments to get business back to operational. Secondly, containment of the threat can't be slow. I mentioned earlier, on average, people without detection and response capabilities can expect about a 200 day period to go by between when the, the bad stuff gets in and when you find out about it. Now think about the access to your crown jewels, to your data, to the private consumer information you're storing, and the amount of damage that can be done or data stolen within 200 days. Absent, of course, an effective detect detection response strategy. So the slower you contain a threat, the larger and more expensive and time consuming the damage will be. So, and, and lastly, if a breach of private information has occurred, you're legally obligated to notify certain parties within a certain time frame. Now that's gonna depend on what state you're in 
at all 50 states have breach notification requirements and they vary. Some say 72 hours, some say within a reasonable time frame and leave it open to interpretation. Um, others have other time frames. Um, in some states, you must notify the attorney general. So other states, depending on how many private records were involved, it could also include the state police. Uh, so you have to know what that looks like far in advance of it happening. And figuring that out while you're being attacked is not the right time to do it. So um, know the law. You can Google it. Everybody, everybody here on the call today can Google. Um, and that's just what we suggest you do. Um, again, if you look at some of the newer regulations, look for the words or a phrase like monitoring for unauthorized access to private information. That phrase, again, is a pointer to having an effective detection and response strategy in place. Now, I, this is not a sales thing at all, but this is what detection and response looks like. Number one, you have to be able to ingest, we're looking at the bottom left here, all the information from your routers, your switches, your firewalls, Active Directory, your workstations, your servers, you have to be able to take all that information, timestamp it, correlate it, from there, run it through various threat intelligence feeds to see if a workstation is reaching out to a, a known bad IP address, a server is making a communication outbound to a known command and control server. Um, you know, somebody clicks on, on, on a, an attachment and there's a post, uh, there's a get and a post, an HTTP post that shows that maybe they just gave their credentials out. We look at all this stuff in, in a managed detection and response scenario, correlate, aggregate it, correlate it. And then of course, even if it's three o'clock in the morning, we're able to say, hey, that doesn't look right. Let's investigate and then pick up the phone and establish a war bridge for when, uh, when you are getting hacked so that you can quickly stamp out the bad guys, create the firewall rule, blow out the virtual machine, reimage the server, whatever the thing is that needs to be done to get the bad guys out. And, and doing it with that kind of strategy versus, hey, I'm just gonna you know, go and get an insurance policy. You know, I would not advocate for the latter. Now, again, a lot of you guys are, are in a hybrid cloud environment where some, some percentage of your workflows exist outside of the four walls of your building. You gotta also make sure that when you're aggregating all your security intelligence, you're including those cloud workflows. So on the bottom right, you see some common ones, AWS, Azure, Salesforce, G Suite and so on. These are just a short list. But you know, if you're looking at your overall security posture, posture and aggregating all these things and you're not including your cloud workflows, well, then you're missing a potentially large percentage of visibility. And let's face it, with phishing being one of the primary ways that people get into your network, if you're not monitoring O365, you not really have a big blind spot. Lastly, a communication strategy is, is kind of the final point I want to make here. And I'll keep this slide deck quick in case there's any questions. You see pl plans fail for lack of counsel, right? Um, I've seen this time and time again where, you know, we're, we're under attack and, you know, and, and everybody's pointing at IT and why I thought IT was going to take care of that. And IT is like, well, what process is in place? You know, leadership should have had a process and everybody starts to argue because everybody else thought it was somebody else's job. <laughs> you don't wanna be in that scenario. Um, so, you know, I, I think a lot of times people feel like cybersecurity is a, a fire drill because too often it is, right? Um, people will, will say things like, I'm too small, I'm not a target. You know, I have a strong firewall or endpoint protection strategy and that's my strategy. You know, I'm not gonna to align to the NIST framework. You know, I'm not gonna communicate with other people. I'm just gonna put, protections in place and cross my fingers and then I'll, I'll get insurance on the back end and, and hope I don't have to use it. That's again, not the way to approach it. Our suggestion is assume that you're gonna be hacked at some point and then how well you do under duress will be a function of three things. These monthly tactical discussions, this would ensure that everybody who's receiving routine action items is actually executing them. Some companies have change control meetings where changes to systems are communicated to multiple stakeholders. I found that during these meetings, many times a proposed change had to be canceled because another department would be adversely affected, right? Somebody in IT operations may want to patch a web server. 
Um, and then in so doing, maybe that's a period of time that that would be detrimental because that's a high period of traffic, right? So that, that's a, a red flag. The tactical discussions are meant to communicate these things. On a quarterly basis, it gets a little bit more visionary. Um, and risk reviews on a quarterly basis allow stakeholders to zoom out of the minutia and think about big picture things. So perhaps trends have emerged over time that require larger discussion. I've seen vulner vulnerability reports hundreds of pages long that a simple tweak to Active Directory would fix in mere minutes. So quarterly risk reviews help us discuss systematic and systemic issues and potential solutions, kind of zoomed out a little bit. And then again, plan for the inevitable. I mentioned earlier, all 50 states have breach notification requirements. On top of that, there are state, federal, and local laws. Um, so it's important to know what those are. And the most restrictive of that super set of laws are the ones that you, you have to follow. So if this law says notify consumers when, within 30 days of a breach, but then you have another law that applies to you that says do it within 72 hours, well, you got to do it in 72 hours. It's the more restrictive of the three. Um, and we, when we think about incident response plans, again, a lot of times people think, oh, it's an IT issue. IT will deal with that. IT is not generally suited for PR. They're not generally suited for legal advice, right? They're good at IT. Lawyers are good at law and PR firms are, are good at upholding companies' reputation. So we do suggest that in your incident response plan, it involves legal counsel, it involves PR, obviously leadership and stakeholders at the organization. But again, it's not, you know, incident response and your communication shouldn't be happening in just the vacuum of IT. Now that's the uh, the end of the actual um, my part of it. I'll, I'll hand it back to Alex to talk through uh, next steps here. Thank you, Jeff. That was uh, incredibly informative, and um, you know, having sat on the customer side of uh, the table for 24 years, I've had the, the the pleasure and the opportunity to implement a lot of the. Uh, very, very useful and you know, to some extent almost common sense uh, security measures that you have uh, described here. And, and uh, to pull vault off of that, I'd like to uh, just remind everyone that uh, Winslow does offer a complimentary secure score assessment, which will just take 60 minutes of your time to provide you with a consultative and uh, thoughtful uh, assessment of, of your network uh, aligning with the NIST cybersecurity framework. And uh, do reach out to your Winslow account executive to schedule that as uh, quickly as you possibly can. A lot of uh, regulations are, in fact, coming down the pipe. Uh, so, since we're right up against the clock, I'm afraid we're not able to answer any questions here live. We'll definitely have a uh, Winslow team member get back to you uh, as soon as possible if any questions were submitted. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everyone for joining us today. We hope this was valuable. If you'd like more information on either Winslow or AWS, please contact us at webinars at winslowtg.com. Next month, we'll discuss email security. Specifically, we'll talk about Winslow with AWN and Mindcap. So please be sure to register. On behalf of both Winslow and AWN, thank you and have a great day.